There's usually a typical process of becoming a Microsoft MVP. You either get nominated by an internal Microsoft employee or you get nominated by, you know, another MVP. And then you go through the process, do your submissions, which I'll talk about and uh, kind of hope for the best. But my experience was arguably very unique. I don't know if there have been any other experiences like this. So I figured why not make a video about it and chat. So I just got my Microsoft MVP today of the recording. This is uh, January 1st, 2025. I'm not 100% sure when I'm posting this, but uh, you know, that's when I got it. So I got the MVP in the Azure category and that was for Azure Kubernetes and open source. Now, like I said in the beginning of the video, my experience was uh, a little bit different. So I'll, I'll actually start this off by saying that I've been denied twice for the Microsoft MVP. This was the third time and apparently the third time is the charm. Now, why was my experience a little bit different? Well, I woke up one day, this was probably uh, a week and a half or two weeks before KubeCon. KubeCon North America 2024, it was in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah this year. And I got a LinkedIn message from somebody at Microsoft on the, on the MVP team, which uh, I will leave them nameless just because I, I didn't ask them if I can put them in the video, but I'll, I'm going to tell them about the video and if they say yes, I will uh, put their name in the description below. So they reached out to me and they said, hey, uh, you know, are you going to KubeCon? And I said, yeah, I'm going to KubeCon. And they said, well, I would love to chat with you about the Microsoft MVP program. Now, this was, again, a very unique experience because usually you get nominated by an MVP or you get nominated by somebody that works at Microsoft. You usually don't get reached out to from somebody on the MVP team. So that's really cool. And I said, all right, cool, sounds good. And then he said, and this was arguably one of the coolest parts, he wanted me to have uh, breakfast with Brendan Burns. And I said, well, that's awesome. If you're not familiar with Brendan Burns, he is uh, one of the co-founders of Kubernetes. He worked at Google, now he works at Microsoft as a VP, leading uh, a bunch of really, really cool products and projects. So I said, wow, this is, uh, this is shaping up to be, you know, an event that's well worth the money. So I said, yeah, you know, sure, sounds good. Went, uh, long story short, I did have the sit down, had the chat, everything was great. Uh, I had the breakfast with Brendan, that was really awesome as well. Uh, it's cause it's really, you know, obviously awesome to sit across from somebody and, and have a conversation about what Kubernetes looks like today, what my thoughts are on Kubernetes, where, you know, everything's gonna be going and what the landscape of cloud native ultimately looks like. So that it was really, really just an absolutely great experience. And then the person that recommended me to the person at Microsoft, which again, I will uh, leave them nameless, but I will put their name in the, uh, in the description if they give me approval to do so. So I sat with him, he nominated me. And by the way, this is the, the, the crazy part about it is all of this happened, you know, the meeting with the person at Microsoft, which he's not the one that nominated me. I just, I just sat down with him because he's on the MVP team. So sat down with him and then the breakfast with Brendan, this happened all before I was even nominated. Okay. Which was again, really cool because usually the process is you get nominated and then you go through the whole thing. So then after all this, I got nominated and I went and I put in, you know, everything that they ask you for, which essentially is a list of community driven accomplishments that, that you've done, you know, over the past year. And this was really cool for me because uh, what everybody maybe doesn't see, I mean, I, you know, people see me posting on LinkedIn and, and the socials and stuff all the time, but what you don't see behind the scenes is I work seven days a week. I mean, and, and this is not to say, you know, everybody has to work seven days a week. I, I, my concern is not with what everybody else is doing, whatever you want to do, whatever you feel comfortable with me personally, I like working a lot. I like building. I like, I enjoy this stuff. Like this is what I do for fun. You know, I don't go out and party or I don't go out and do this and do that. This is what I do for fun. I, I'm one of the very few people that had the, that, that has the ability in life to turn a hobby into a career. 
And I was able to do that over 10 years ago when I started in tech. And when I became self-employed, you know, one of the things that I loved doing, well, two things that I love, three things that I loved doing was consulting. So I loved working with, you know, organizations across the globe on various different projects. I loved content creation, podcasts, blogs, YouTube, uh, books, all that good stuff, live streams, all of it. And then the live training that I do. So I do a lot of live training. And I was able to take all that stuff and, and turn it into something that, you know, makes me money, which is really, really awesome. Because uh, yes, you know, despite what everybody may think, I know everybody loves things that, that are free out there and all that good stuff. But at the end of the day, this is my business. This is what I do for a living. But I put in seven days, you know, a week worth of work. I work holidays, I work weekends, all of it. My job is to translate technical complexity into small bits and bytes that everybody can understand and get value from. Okay, so I'm turning technical complexity into value, whether it's working with vendors that I work with, whether it's working with consulting clients, live training clients, whoever it is. So yeah, I get paid for these things because this is my business, but the work that I put in on the back end to uh, have the ability to have the expertise to showcase it to the community is, you know, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes. So to have something like the Microsoft MVP, even just to get nominated for it and to be able to put in all my contributions, it's, it's really cool because again, like there are so many things that are, that happen behind the scenes in life and, and, you know, all the work that I put in. So it's really cool to just get that accomplishment of like, you know, what I'm doing, it seems to be working, which is really, really cool. So I got the nomination. I put in all the information. This was, uh, you know, I, I did the nomination at KubeCon. So, you know, about a month and a half ago, and then I was able to get in in this round of Microsoft MVPs. Okay. So what am I going to be doing differently now that I am in the program? Well, nothing. You know, one of the biggest things that I mentioned, even before getting into the program, I said, look, I, I personally love Azure. A lot of the stuff that I do is on Azure. Uh, any of the live trainings that I do, for example, like 9.999 times out of 10, I'm doing it in, in AKS, Azure Kubernetes service. Like I'm always in Azure, but I do love other products and other services as well. I do talk about AWS. I do talk about GCP and I want to well, I said, you know, I said I wanted to continue to be able to do this stuff and luckily they were totally cool with it. So it's not something that like I just have to do Azure stuff. Although what this allows me to do is it allows me to dive deeper into Azure because I can talk to, you know, technical product teams now. I can dive deeper into the services and I can get a better grasp of everything that's happening in the Azure realm. And the other thing is, so I've been really just focus on Kubernetes for a while now. Uh, my career has went from, you know, systems administration to somewhere in the middle, I switched to software development. And then I, you know, got to a point where I was doing a little bit of both, right? I was doing you know, software development and automation stuff. And I was also doing infrastructure. Uh, maybe you, you call it DevOps or platform engineering or S3 or, you know, whatever you call it. I, I ended up just doing both. And when I started creating content, I was doing everything. Like I was talking about everything in, in the, in the, the realm of, of the world, but you know, I was still gaining a follower count, uh, and I was still, you know, trying to get my name out there and I was still doing all that stuff because here's the thing about content creation. Here's the thing about, you know, being self-employed or a solopreneur or whatever you want to call it. You can be the best engineer in the room, right? You can write the best code. You can have the best products, everything. But if you can't get that stuff out there into the world, uh, it's just going to go into the ether. Unfortunately, it's just the way that it works. I think that's the way that the world always kind of worked, uh, but you know, we see it more so. So yeah, you know, I don't believe in like doing everything just for, for followers. I don't believe in, you know, doing everything just for likes and impressions because I don't do that. Uh, I put out a lot of stuff and you know, it'll maybe get two likes if I'm lucky. And then I put out a lot of stuff and it gets, you know, hundreds of thousands. So it's, I point is, is that I don't do it just for the likes and the comments and, and the views and stuff like that. However, on the flip side, I do need to make sure that stuff that I'm putting out, I am getting it out into the world properly. So when I started talking about strictly Kubernetes, probably like 
it's 2025. So almost three years ago at this point, it's crazy. Uh, I, I started to gain a lot of traction and I started to get, you know, a lot of clients from it and stuff. So I was able to sustain being self-employed. So I said, okay, I'm just going to dive into this Kubernetes, you know, hole of madness because there's a lot of stuff in the Kubernetes space. And I'm still going to talk about Kubernetes. I'm still going to talk about containerization. I'm still going to, you know, do all that stuff. However, what I've missed is everything else. You know, I've missed being able to talk about other services, you know, like serverless or different ways to run uh, containers. You know, I've been doing a lot of Wasm stuff. Maybe you've seen me doing a lot of the Wasm stuff. I've been talking a lot about Wasm. And the other thing that I'm really interested in well is, you know, this whole hybrid cloud thing. So hybrid cloud and multi-cloud and stuff has been around for a while, but it seems like in 2025, a lot of people are thinking about it or talking about implementing hybrid cloud more. Now, will that be Kubernetes? Maybe, but it could also be implementing other pieces of cloud-based environments like VMs and such. So I'm going to be talking about a little bit of everything in the cloud native space, still a lot of, you know, Kubernetes stuff, but I do want to talk a lot more about Wasm. I want to talk about just cloud native, Blech, sorry, cloud native as a whole, hybrid cloud, multi-cloud, all that stuff. And another big thing I've been, you know, diving into recently as well is the whole engineering side of LLMs. Uh, you know, when, when Gen AI and stuff first came out, I wasn't really interested. Uh, and then when the hype started to, you know, go down a little bit, I started to get more interested because I was, you know, downloading models. And then I started to fine tune those models. And then I started to create rags for those models. And I started to really see the engineering side of LLMs. And what I've noticed is I can actually fine tune a model for specific things that I needed to do. And that's like a automation 2.0, you know, because instead of just writing code to do automation, now I'm writing code to fine tune a model and then have that model go in and do its thing. So I've been diving a lot more into that stuff as well. And it's all really, really interesting. And, you know, the whole GPU thing is very interesting to me as well. You know, running GPUs on Kubernetes specifically is very, very cool. So I do have a lot of other interests. And I think the reason, so there's two primary reasons that I, you know, really, well, three primary reasons that I really focus on Kubernetes for a while. The first, I really liked Kubernetes. Kubernetes caught my interest in 2016. I started implementing it in 2016, way before I started talking about it publicly, because I, I you know, was fortunate enough to work at startups, and those startups wanted to implement the latest and greatest because they were new, so they didn't have a choice. They implemented the latest and greatest. So I got an opportunity to work with Kubernetes very, very early on, and I you know, followed through and to now with it. So number one, I really enjoyed it. Number two, it seemed to catch on very quickly. So when I started talking about it, it was like people were hungry for the information. You know, the blo every blog that I put out was a hit. Every video that I put out was a hit. And then it just, it grew from there. So I was like, you know what? I think this is a good path for me to go down to, you know, be as close to an, you know, SME, a subject matter expert as possible. And then what that allowed me to do, the third reason was, because I was gaining so much traction in the Kubernetes space, I was able to grow my audience, grow vendors that I was working with, grow potential clients in a way that I said, okay, let me continue down this path because this is allowing me to be self-employed, right? Which is, you know, what I wanted to do. So those are the three primary reasons. And now that, you know, I got, I, I have good traction in terms of like, you know, the content that I put out there and stuff. And I've met a lot of really great people and all that. I have other interests in tech, you know, like I said, you know, all the stuff that I was talking about before, I have this interest in these things and I want to start to talk about those things and I want to start to do those things. Uh, and I want to start to implement those things for consulting clients and, and advisory clients that I have. So what the Microsoft and uh, Remember, I said, uh, why, what's going to change? This is still all part of that. I've, I've just been going on a rant at this point. I'm at 16 minutes. Wow. So what the Microsoft MVP is going to allow me to do is it it gives me a little bit more motivation to start talking about, you know, a little bit of everything again and to really branch out. So I'm super excited about that. If you're interested in diving into getting a Microsoft MVP, uh, if you're interested in, you know, how it works, what you need feel free to reach out. I'm, I'm happy to help. 
there's a lot of different categories. There is uh, an AI category. There's the Azure category. There's a data center management category. There's some, there's a mobile category, I think. And there's a, there's, I don't know if there's a security category. I think there might be. And there are, there are a bunch of different other categories. So whatever your specialty is, I'm, I'm sure that there's a category for it or something that resembles your specialty. So I'm really, really excited to see what this year brings. Uh, it was awesome to wake up at, you know, I will I actually, funny enough, because I, I just, you know, wake up throughout the night. I never sleep through the night. I woke up at 3.08 a.m. And the email, the, the MVP acceptance email came in at 3.02 a.m. So when I read it, I got super excited and I couldn't fall back asleep. And then I fell back asleep at 4.30 and I woke up at 6 to go to the gym. And uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm probably tired, which is why I'm rambling. But I think I kind of always ramble a little bit when I get excited. I'm really, really excited to see where this goes. And like I said, if you have any questions about it, if you know, you're know you curious of the process, feel free to reach out. I am happy to help. And let's see what 2025 brings because uh, this acceptance came in you know, January 1st, the, the, the first day of the new year, which is, you know, uh, pretty good motivation to, you know, go down the path that I want to go down now. So thank you so much for watching. Really do appreciate it. And of course, feel free to reach out. Happy to chat.